we were talking about was how your start in stage makeup really, pre really, not to pun intended, but set the stage for you to have a really particular point of view in, in, or in your technique, really. It yeah, allows you to kind I, of see people from a different sort of perspective that you wouldn't have normally. Yeah, I never really viewed makeup as like a, uh, a really, a, a key to a vanity or, or anything like that. It was really, for me, it was always about creative expression. And I think that an understanding that I was speaking a visual language, I kind of was looking to connect to it in that way from the very beginning. So all the things that excited me about stage makeup translated into my work, whether it was in the red carpet or more, you know, of a natural look, I always was looking for a way to kind of showcase something about the person Yes, um, and and translate something about that person. That's anyway, interesting. Could, yeah. When you, well, we're going to talk about how you transition from stage makeup to New York and Paris and fashion shows. Yeah. But that's interesting. So when you when you work with celebrity clients and you work with many of them, is there is there sort of a framework that you build for that person, like a color palette, a story? Do you approach um, people in the same? your celebrity clients in the same way? I do. I mean, I approach them. I, a lot of my, my long-term clients, we really like to channel like characters, you know? See? It's the same yeah. thing. It's what, yeah. exactly what you just described. Yeah. I think, you know, what I found, it's interesting about actresses for me or, at, you know, actors of any kind is that they're very uncomfortable being themselves. Um, they don't really know who they are when they're just being them. They really do kind of connect more to being a character or channeling some sort of like character that they're, that they're, you know, whether it be on a red carpet or in a photo shoot, I feel like it feels more comfortable to them to channel something else. So I often like love doing that with my clients. We, we create something, we come up with some idea, you know, and then I work through whatever that is. And sometimes that's with the photographer. And sometimes that's with both the, the client and the photographer or whatever. But for red carpet, I've always loved coming up with, with sort of a narrative. I think what that's we're so great. Yeah. I think it's great to come up with the narrative because then yeah. you, it's a springboard and then all these other ideas probably spring from that. And right. And it allows, right. You're, it allows the person that you're working with to really feel, feel the look and feel the vibe yeah. and what's going on. Yeah. Don't we and all so, want to do that? I mean, I feel like, I feel like we all, I mean, it's like, obviously when it comes to those bigger events, like the Oscars or the Golden Globes or something, it's like, those are much more, you know, I don't know, I, the pressure and all of that stuff is there. But when you're talking about like, I feel like even I do, I feel that way. Like I want to kind of, what, you know, some days I, I choose colors that make me feel strong. Sometimes I'm feeling more soft and I just don't want bright colors. Like it doesn't appeal to me because that's just not what I'm, I'm connecting to that day. I kind of feel more demure or more in my feminine side. Sometimes I need red to make me feel powerful or like I can take on the day. And I think we all do that. We just don't, we're not as cognizant of it, you know, because we don't have to be. Um, yes. But I think that I am in the process of like basically working with transformational energy with my clients. Like we're creating something that's going to help them get out of their sweatpants and in front of millions of people. And that's, that's a really interesting energy to work with. It's a I powerful it's energy. It's, yeah. it's very powerful energy. Yeah. It's really, uh, it's so fun. I so love it. In so the, much. back to the beginning, you worked, you worked in San Francisco at the Opera House, and then you made your way into the world of fashion, right? And you were doing shows in New York, and you were doing shows in Paris, the best shows ever. How did that come about? That really was, How did you again, make the transition? just absolute passion for me it was like you know I know the word passion is overrated at this point like people kind of you know fling it around but I was sort of just unstoppable I, I wanted to be a part of creating fantasy in the world I wanted to work with you know uh people that I admired and um on, on run for me at the time when I was coming up runway was quite theatrical I mean we I was like it was the time of McQueen and Galliano and all of these like really over the top, incredible, fantastical couture creations. And I would go into the magazine stand and I would get like back then you didn't have Vogue.com. So you just have these magazines where they'd have the entire collection and the makeup and the hair and everything in it. And I would just pour over these magazines and be like, I'm going to do that one day. I have to get to Paris. I have to do this. And um, I was 
I was lucky enough to actually get hired uh, by Mac at that time. I was in San Francisco. They were opening a store in um, in New York called Mac Pro, which was on Fifth yep. Avenue. And it was upstairs and it was only for artists. It was only for uh, just just for, for makeup artists that were in the business. And so I was able to work with like the biggest makeup artists in the business, creating all of the, helping them create the makeup for the look. So like if Pat McGrath, for instance, came in and said, okay, I'm doing the Versace show and I need a cream color and bright yellow. Um, I would literally go back to them. The lab would make it for her. I would have to take, you know, I'd have to help them in that creation process and that, for me, got me connected with all of these incredible artists that I admired so, so much and was able to get into their creative mind and see how they worked, their, their, see how their process worked. And what so a cool, what, again, work. another a very cool and invaluable way to make your way in. Oh my God. Age, you know, and, and you were, you were um, creating and you were curating and yes. you were already used to storytelling because- And I was insatiably you, curious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, do, you, do you remember working on any of those big shows that you mentioned? Um, who a favorite designer was? Oh, any, well, any I got. I got to I got to create a show with Vivian Westwood um, oh. as a key artist, and I think for me at that time in my twenties, I mean that was, I think that for me was like, I, I I cried, you know, before I went to you know I was just a mess of emotion. I got to sit with her and have, you know, creative conversations and talks and have dinner with her. And I was just like, I, I, I at that point I was like, okay, I, I don't need anything. I'm, I'm done. Also, right. I think for me, Chanel Couture being with Peter Phillips, creating um, the Couture shows for, with Chanel was another huge highlight for me. Just pinch me kind of stuff. Um, and there's definitely shows that I look back and go, oh my God, I'm so, you know, I think there's certain ones where I'm, I feel like it was a total dream and I those yeah I think those are the two probably that first come to mind yeah and then you've also worked you know you've done a lot of cover shoots with magazines um I, this it's kind of an interesting question coming from me because I've worked for a bunch of different magazines myself was there a diff could you could you would you recognize or would you have rec recognized a, a certain vibe or tone or set of expectations tied to a particular magazine did everyone have sort of a different approach to shoots and beauty shoots and cover shoots oh god yeah I mean, yeah first of all there's so many politics I mean, that you know you've been in, you're in our you know you know our business is full of, of politics and um you know it's like okay if you're constantly working with bazaar then you're not working with vogue though certain photographers worked with i mean things are very different now this was a time where you know if if you were on contract for harper's bazaar you never ever were going to shoot for condé nast like there was just there were just yeah, you were either rules. first or Condé Nast. Yeah, or... there were rules. And um, I think, you know, for a lot of us who started out in, you know, a particular time, Vogue was the, you know, it, it was the pinnacle. And I think for me, it was like, okay, I really want, you know, I know that I'll make it when I get a cover of Vogue kind of thing. Like that was, and for me, I was always like, for me, it was Italian Vogue. Italian Vogue was the thing, you know. And Italian Vogue, Vogue was, uh, was considered really considered fashion art. A fashion, fashion art. Fashion photography wanted, art. Yeah, I wasn't as I wasn't as interested in just a beautiful cover. I wanted like a cover that was gonna like stop you in your tracks. You know, the kind that you would see and just not be able to walk past this the 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 stand. And that was like for me, that was Italian Vogue at the time. Now I think it's British Vogue. Oh, I love um, British Vogue. British what Vogue is like it right now. Um, but yeah, there were always rules. There were rules about you know Anna only liked covers that were out outdoors. You know, not studio covers were not her thing. You know, there's all that stuff. I mean, Grace Coddington to me was like more my vibe because I love, again, the fantastical elements of fashion. And I love to, I love it as a, a form of escapism. So I was never looking for that like pretty, you know, I didn't love those covers that were sort of like a girl in a pretty natural light, never spoke to me the same way. You know, I wanted like, I wanted Craig McDean. I wanted, you wanted to play. <laughs> I wanted Steven Mizell. I yeah, wanted, you know, yeah. Um, and then in not a strange twist, but what's uh, serendipitous in a way is that your career kind of right then took a bit of a full circle because you came back to entertainment and working with entertainers and people on stage and screen. And how yeah. did how how did that shift in your career? occur? It was so random. I mean, to be honest with you, I was in New York and my I was, you know, being from San Francisco, being from, you know, most I was born in New York, but I came out to LA or not LA, but to San Francisco when I was five. I mean, I was not 
raised in in uh, New York most of my life since I was five years old. So I thought I'm going to go back to New York and it's going to feel like absolute home. I'm going to totally be at home. And then I didn't feel that way initially. I was there working, there working. People would, would ask me to come out to LA and do a job. I'd never been to LA. And I don't know if anyone knows this. If you're not from the Bay Area, you don't know, probably don't know. But like, you're basically raised to hate LA. Like, you don't even yes. know why. Like, it's like, oh my God, never. You would it's never. It's them and it's us. Yeah. It's, yeah, exactly. It's just so, it's like we're on two different sports teams or like, you know, it, mm -hmm. it, it's crazy. And I didn't, I never understood it, but, but I'd never even been here really. So I got a job out here where someone hired me to fly out from New York to LA. And Do you remember I, what year that was, Rachel? It was, yeah, it was probably like, I want to say 1999, something oh, okay. like that. And I, and they, they wanted to pay me like great salary to do what I love. I was like, wait, what's the problem here, guys? Like, what's going on? <laughs> you know, I was working for free in New York, like coming home, crying on my bed, you know, just like from pure exhaustion. And, and then people in LA were like, oh, there was, there was an incredible opportunity. There were so many opportunities because there weren't a lot of really uh, people with a certain type of eye for fashion or anything really living here doing makeup at the time. They all had a very different aesthetic. So when I came out here, I was really in a rare pocket. A little, I had a really small niche that worked for me. Um, so a lot of the fashion photographers that would come out to LA didn't have get to have their team. And then they would be able to hire me because, oh, okay, she's as close as I'm going to get to someone from New York. And right that place, really right time. Right place, right time. It worked in my favor. And at that time, the David LaChapelle was shooting a lot of stuff. I remember really yeah. crazy covers. And so my very first celebrity cover was um, with David LaChapelle and Brittany Murphy for Flaunt magazine. It was the Oh, I did so many Flaunt shoots when I was oh, living Oh, God. In LA. I mean, it was just like super over the top, really fun. Again, totally played to my strengths. And then I started working, doing a lot of that kind of stuff. And then I started doing um, a lot of music videos, which at the time, there was still a lot of, a lot of yeah. things. So I worked with everyone, like... I did the most elaborate music videos. They were like basically like performances, like doing a huge play or a stage performance. So it was again, fully playing to my strengths. Everything about it was like, I was in heaven, you know? I was- Yeah, there, it, there was, you know, that time ended probably how many years later? You know, like four or five years. Yeah, four yeah, years it later. Yeah, it was not a long the, period The of day time. of the music video, of the elaborate, like, you know, three day, 17 hour day music video. Oh, was gone. Seven days sometimes. Seven, seven days sometimes. days sometimes. I mean, yeah. I had, like, I'm talking, like, every artist I can even, I mean, like, the Smashing Pumpkins, Marilyn Manson, Gwen Stefani, Bjork, um, Michael Jackson, <laughs> George Michael. I mean, these elaborate things that you could not believe that I was a part of. I And I was, like, I was in I was in my version of heaven because all I got to do was imagine stuff and create it all the time. So uh, and get paid really, really well to do it. You were so in your element. I was. <laughs> and what these days are you working mostly with celebrity clients? Are you working with beauty brands? You do a lot of work with beauty brands as well. I do. I work a lot with beauty brands. I work a lot with um, actors, like you know, I I mean Emma Stone's been one of my longest clients, probably since I know, she always flawless. Thank Emma Stone's flawless like, makeup is Rachel. Oh, thank you. Yeah, since since super bad, like we've been working, we've worked together, um, which has been just such a wonderful, wonderful relationship and such a joy. Um, and uh, yeah, I I I really have had, I'm I kind of have curated my my clients in such a way where I feel like they're they're just my people, and that's kind of how. And then occasionally I get lucky enough to be introduced to someone new and and have a moment with them. And sometimes it's right, sometimes it's not. But I usually, I'm I'm lucky enough at this point in my career to make choices based on what's what kind of per people I want to be around and whether or not that's that's right a joyful experience for me. That's right, and that's really yeah. important, especially it these is. days. Uh, yeah. Our podcast with you releases today and it includes your co-founder Doreen Block and Kevin O'Quinn's niece Samantha we'll get into those details but first let's um, kind of go back to how the makeup museum came about um, and how did a busy red carpet makeup artist working with actors like yourself get involved in such a project well as you kind of like and probably get a little bit from our conversations both of them that we, you know I'm mad about beauty and everything every facet of it and its history and its um, its intricacies, and I think 
that you know people around you know that know me know that about me <laughs> I'm like I'm you know a little bit nuts for it so when I had a good friend who met Doreen heard that she was gonna do this they were like oh you gotta you gotta talk to Rachel like this you guys need to meet and that's really how that like thing ha that's how that happened I was introduced to Doreen totally by chance and she was serious and Doreen's the person that makes things happen and it's pretty we talk about that on the podcast yeah and I I again being an artist have a lot of ideas and sometimes they come to fruition and sometimes they end up on the on the floor like forgotten or whatever things come to me and, and go and I think I'd always dreamed of the, the reality that there would be a reality where in which there was a makeup museum, a place, an institution that honored and the history and of beauty and makeup throughout, you know, our entire from globally and historically, right? Right. And there, it was shocking to me there wasn't one, and and I couldn't believe it. And I when that's the same way Doreen felt. She's like, how can this not exist? And I'm like, well, because there, there's so much history behind makeup, and even just in the in our conversation. There's stage yeah. makeup for opera. There's, you know, uh, all sorts of makeup. And it, makeup has a huge, rich history. So, so much. And it's still continuing to just shift and change and affect us in ways that we're not even conscious of. Yes. I, think, I think that that's really where I get my excitement around it is like the feeling of being able to just, I don't know, open people up to the idea that like you're participating in something that is goes like so far back you have no idea you yes are, i mean we're talking like cleopatra and yeah. Cole Liner. before that before, before that, that we have before been that. adorning our bodies and faces as humans yeah. to to connect to each other to to signal to each other to speak to each other before we had the words to understand what we were saying we were speaking a visual language of makeup and beauty so you know, whether it meant that you was a social status thing or whether it meant that it was ritualistic around certain times of year or whatever, but these things are primal. They are in our DNA. They are part of who we are and we relegate it to the world of vanity, but it has really very little to do with that. And that's yeah. what I'm excited to share with it's you. It's a bigger picture about expressing oneself and yes. Yes. And have you something very specific to working on something like a museum? Have you come to learn a lot about obtaining items for a museum yes and that part that part is really tricky and that part as Doreen is mostly the one behind a lot of that and I obviously have my opinions about certain things that really I think are, are important um in the collection and things I would love to see in the collection over over you know because what we're, our biggest vision is to create an institution that houses beauty from it's you know from this earliest known phases to now to today so you know getting there I've, I've been to there's only two that I've ever been to that have showcased that really well which was um there's the Max Factor Museum or the Hollywood Museum here in in Los Angeles yes. that was the original studios of Max Factor which we kind of paid homage to in the museum yes and then there's um the, I've been to a museum in Grasse in France it's mostly uh there to to for the history of fragrance, fragrance. they do have quite a few um, beauty elements and things that ha are related to beauty um but i think you know and every museum has bits and pieces but they don't fully go there because i think it's always a subject that's been considered less artful or not as it's not a fine art because i guess it's ephemeral it doesn't you can wash it off i don't know right it's, right. it's interesting because I really want people to understand like that this is something that we are not only as humans been doing since the beginning of time, but the people who have been doing it at a certain level have sh changed the way we see each other and the world. Like that's fine art. It, absolutely. I say things like that all the time. Uh, what would you say your favorite makeup museum exhibit is besides the one that we're about to talk about, which is an exhibit on Kevin O'Quinn? Is there something else that comes to mind? I mean, I was just there the other day and I thought it was so reading through Erno Laszlo's pres skincare prescriptions yeah. for Jackie Kennedy and for Marilyn Monroe. I found that so interesting. I Is know, there something really. at the museum that you just love? I really think for me, like, I really wanted people to understand like how the woman of that time felt. And so sometimes I think like I, the advertising aspect of it really kind of, I wanted, I wanted everyone who came there to really understand like what it felt like to be marketed to as a woman in that era 
And as a woman in that era, it was not about expression. It wasn't about feeling good about yourself. It wasn't about connecting to yourself. It was about looking a particular way externally in order to keep your man, hold a man, find a man, keep a man. And hopefully, you know, uh, it was just, it was, it was so limited. It was so completely against what we believe today. We should be connect, you know, what we should be talking about that I wanted that to come across and like, I hope it did, but I, I just think like for me, it's about looking at the entire, um, looking at the entire exhibit. Yeah, puppy, I'm on, I'm on a live call right now. <laughs> My son is like, um, yes. So I think for me, it was really about just the whole, the whole thing of like kind of walking in and going, oh, if I was a woman that lived in this time period, this is what the beauty ideal would have been. And if I didn't fit into that, how would I have been experiencing the world? Right. If I couldn't if I couldn't use this template in order to make myself, you know, because there yeah. wasn't like, oh, if you have this skin color or if you have this type of nose or this face shape, it's like, nope, everybody just put a template on and this is what you look like. Yeah. And I think that that was important for people to look at and to understand. And, How far you know, a great <laughs> museum or great exhibits in a museum do just that, right? They're thought yeah. provoking. Yeah. And so, um, so the Makeup Museum obtained, well, it is digitizing the journals of, of Kevin O'Quinn, he's a huge makeup artist in the 80s and the 90s. And essentially his journals are a collection of weekly planners. And we talk about that on the podcast. Before handheld devices, before the notes app on your phone um, and the calendar app, many of us, myself included, had these like robust planners. And if you were a creative, those calendar planners often included photos, or items torn out from magazines, you would make them pictorial, which is yeah. exactly what Kevin did with him. And they're fascinating to look at now. Did you keep a similar kind of journal at some any point in your career, Rachel? Or were, you, were you just, I mean, you were probably just always running around with a kit. And I wish I had. I, I yeah. looking, at, looking at his, I, I kind of look back and go, God, I wish I had. I have a box of things that I have kept and documented somewhat, but I didn't document it the, nearly the way that Kevin did. And that's why these are so extraordinary to look at because not only did he keep completely detailed notes of every incredible experience, whether it was, you know, and for him, incredible experiences involved, you know, doing doing makeup on Diana Ross or, or some amazing, you know, or Barbara Streisand, and also going and visiting his parents for, you know, and seeing his niece, you know, he was a equally passionate person about family and about connection and also with his, with his own heritage, but then also about his work. So he documented his life. He documented his, his, his ability to like, you know, and he documented the whole trajectory. So it's like, you know, you see this person go from someone, a little, you know, this, this kid from, you know, Baton Rouge to you see him go through this whole hierarchy and then you see him get to the absolute yes. pinnacle of, yes. our, of our business. And it's, it's so fun to watch. I mean, we he, have some of them known? here. This is, so this is a snippet with Cindy Crawford for a Revlon campaign. I mean, and that's is that Abaddon Stephen Klein. shooting it? Or Stephen Klein? Stephen Klein. And then we have, yeah. the, you know, I, I have that one, which is oh, like, yeah. there's like a young uh, Sally Hirschberger. The hair it's thing incredible. I know. Yep. I, was, I look how young she, I know. Yep. Isn't that insane? And then, yeah. So that's what they sort of look like. They're, they're, they're entry, journal entries or their calendar planner entries, but the first time I sat with them. them, yeah, the first, I mean, there was, the photographer went to Baton Rouge, took all, you know, did all the documentation um, of them. And then Doreen sent me the, you know, the, the flip books to go through. And I sat there and I, I, I wept, I cried because how on earth he documented everything so beautifully and with such like, there's an innocence about it. It's not snobby. There's nothing about it. It's literally he's in awe of what's happening to him. And you can feel that through these books, right? You can feel that through these journals. It's like, oh my God. You know, it's never like, oh yeah, I went to work today. No, it's like, I got to do this today. Can you really know? And almost like he's looking at them in his own disbelief. Like he had to put it there in order for him to believe it himself. Yeah, I remember we when we were talking with his niece Samantha on the podcast, that's some of what she was saying is that. He had he had like he had a reverence for what he did, and he wanted to document everything and just kind of make it have have something physical to look at to make yeah. it a reality. 
And he was, you know, again, he seemed like from what we heard from her, just so grounded that you don't feel alienated by these journals because even though they are the epitome, they are the, they, they, ex they are, you're looking at pictures of Polaroids by Penn, Avedon, you know, there's like no one in there not represented that isn't in the upper echelon of, you know, they can't get any higher and the biggest models and the biggest names. And yet you feel the, you feel his innocence throughout it. You feel his amazing yeah. and his, and his gratitude for being a part of them. Can you so, recall as a young makeup artist, when you first took notice of Kevin O'Quinn? Oh my God. Yeah. And I, and I, I mean, Kevin was, when I was, when I was coming up as a makeup artist, you know, the, he was it. I mean, there were many before him that had influenced me without my knowledge because I wasn't, there was really no word in which you, like, there, there was no conversation around who did the makeup for that. Like there wasn't really that <laughs> happening. Um, for me, I remember like the first two makeup artists that really I understood that they were a person <laughs> was Serge Leton and, and Kevin. Um, and Kevin at that time, every cover was his. Every cover of every major magazine that you picked up was his work. And so, you know, I remember going and meeting when, when he, when his book came out, I went and stood in line. I wore the makeup from, from the book, you know, on, that was on Chandra North in the book, the yellow eyeshadow and the red lipstick. And he was like, honey, this is amazing. Your makeup's amazing. And I was just like crying from joy. You know? he, oh, he just what a her. moment. He, it was such a moment. And he was, because that's the thing. And I say this on our podcast, but just so I want people to know and understand is that Kevin was not a snob. You know, I know a lot of people think about fashion and they think about the world of fashion and they see a lot of like, you know, what, what people have been portrayed as being these like snobby elitists. He was a lot of things, but he was not, he was not a snob and he was not an elitist. He really loved people. He loved women. He loved making women feel amazing about themselves. And he, I mean, he, he. I remember seeing him at a Tori Amos concert in New York in the 90s, and I had this crazy makeup. He came up to me to tell me how amazing it was. And <laughs> I mean, this is who he was. He was yeah. a truly marvelous human being and someone that, you know, I think shifted the business, the, pe the way people see our business, too. Well, that's what I was, that was actually one of my next questions for you is, what do you think his impact on the beauty industry at large was? I think it was or is I think it is I think his legacy is is exactly what I just said it's a, it's the sense of everybody belongs everybody gets you get to be fabulous and amazing and talented and at the height of your at the top of your game and you also get to be kind and 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 a, a really it's important that kindness is the thing that that is the weaves throughout all of this stuff because none of the other stuff matters you can have this incredible image and this incredible career. And if everyone hates you at the end of the day, what, what does that point? even mean? Yeah. Yes. What does it even mean when you see, when he passed away, how many people were grieving? It's because of his ultimately his kindness and the way he made people feel. And I think that's his legacy. And, and I think it's even bigger. I mean, his makeup and his artistry are what get you there. But then once you realize like who he was as a person, yes. like, oh, and okay, how do you see, the legacy of him playing out in culture today in terms of makeup art, younger makeup artists today starting out, how do you, how are they interpreting his legacy? Do you think? I think they're doing it without even knowing that they're doing it. I mean, he yeah. opened up the door. He opened up yeah. the door for everyone to walk through really, because he made it, he made trans, he made the idea of transformation like normalized, you know, like it was this big mystery before Kevin. It was like, you kept it behind closed doors. Nobody talked about it. We didn't teach it. We didn't talk about it. Cause it was like, oh, this is this big mystery. Like I come out and I look like this, but no one gets to know how it happened. Right. And, right. That's and, a really good point. Yeah. And Kevin blew that out of the water. And so I think yeah. the makeup artists now are living in a time in which we don't have to keep our secrets. I mean, we understand we each bring something unique to the table that no one else can bring because the bottom line is, I can, you can give me the same five products you can give another makeup artist. We're not going to do the same thing because as artists, we don't know how. We only know how to do what we do. Yes. And, um, and so competition in that regard is really not, it doesn't even make sense. It's a very competitive field in which you really can't compete. So it's yeah. bizarre. Right, right. 
Um, Can you share the yeah. story of how how obtaining the journals came about? How did how did the idea get sparked? How did how did that all happen? So so I am really good friends with Troy Surratt, a makeup artist who I adore um, very much, who worked closely with Kevin until the end of his life. Yes, and um, and they created a documentary with uh, Tiffany Bartok, who is another mm -hmm. good friend of Troy's and someone I met through Troy. Um, and Tiffany is very close with the family and Troy is very close with the family and um, knew about these journals and had basically connected us with, with a family in order to, when, when, when we discussed having a, you know, overall what we want is an institution that's going to be able to, um, you know, to house these, these special items for, for posterity going forward. We want there to be an institution that is going to keep these beautiful documents alive for many, many generations. And there was no one doing that right now. And so they told us that they had them. It's like, okay, we need to, we need to document them immediately before anything happens. And then we want to be the ones to help people um, get to see them and, and, and keep them alive. For and what was it like working with his family? Family is lovely. I mean, you met Samantha. She, and we did, yep. This is, this is like, that, that, that's why it's, it's important for people to know not only Kevin's work, it's important for people to know Kevin. And I think his family wants for people to understand like, yeah, his work is so important in it, into the beauty industry. It will forever be important. But I think what really what they would love is for people to understand how important their, their son, their uncle, their, you know, who, and who, who he was as a well-rounded person. Yeah. Uh, so we, I think I've mentioned this, there are about 16, I think there's 1600 individual pages yeah. that I think, are they still being digitized? Right? Yeah, I think maybe, yeah, are they, they are. still being they worked are. on? They're still being digitized. So not everything mm -hmm. was up for people to see, but whatever we have as we're doing it, we're, we're uploading and then it's, yes. up, so it'll be growing. And our dream ultimately is to be able to showcase these, um, the work inside of these journals in person uh, as a full blown cabinet exhibition. Yeah, That's, I cannot wait to see yeah. that. What is, what is that? For people that don't understand, what what is that process of preservation like? You said that um, a, a photographer was sent, yeah, um, to just so you're just sort of taking the right. I'm sure that that's another ish, you know, important piece too is not only taking a photo, taking photos, but taking the right kind of photos. Yeah, right? but taking the right kind of photos and and then documenting each each page and you know individually. It took it it, it wasn't like a quick process. I mean, there the, there's a lot in those journals, by the way. I mean, I know, and I was going to say what I love about the journals is that. Not only did he document the jobs he worked on, but there were also a lot of selfies. Oh, and there were selfies. a lot of there were a lot of selfies, and there <laughs> were a lot happened of to be by Irving Penn. <laughs> right, right. I mean, I, I mean, why wouldn't you take that picture? Right. right? Um, and there were a lot of photos and stickers that reflected his interest in activism. Yes. Um, but what you talked a little bit about this, but what do you think his journal entries say about how the beauty industry worked at the time? the way that he was sort of keeping these journals, what did that, what did, what did that say about how things worked for a makeup artist like him then? Well, I, mean, I think, how I think, are you getting booked on jobs? Yeah. And then, you know, yeah, I mean, you can see process. editors, editors, he wrote down, you know, that was the other thing. I mean, he wrote down every you know person on the shoot. So not just like, it wasn't just him pictures and what he did. It was like hairdresser, photographer, stylist, editor, like he had all of that there. Yes. Um, he, as I don't know if a lot of people, everybody knows this, if you watch the documentary, you probably do. Um, but, you know, Kevin walked into Vogue and sat in the lobby <laughs> until people would look at his work. You know, he was, and at that time, I mean, you can't imagine doing something like that today. You know, it's just like, what? But yeah, they took it. They took a meeting with him. He came in, he sat down, they looked at, and I remember not going to Vogue that way, but going to um, agencies and stuff and having them physically look at your work. And I think, you know, it was completely nerve wracking and just eviscerating, you know, <laughs> and I think, to be but I think the way. thing that and we do talk about this on the podcast, some, well, a lot, I think we do. Um, and we're talking about now is, especially with the journals, it just, it showed how seriously he took his work and his job. Like he, yeah. he, he took, he took the work very, very seriously. Yes. Um, there was a lot he of passion. Knew, yeah, he knew what was happening while it was happening. Like he knew what he wanted. He was super focused on creating this type of career 
He knew what, who he wanted to work with, what, you know, what kind of work he wanted to do. And then once he got there, he got in the door, but then he knew how to stay in the good graces. He brought such a light to every room he was in. I mean, he, he lifted up everyone in, around him. So, you know, his work um, was so special I and mean, he was truly a painter. He, you know, this is, this was before digital retouching. And I was, I was yeah. explaining this to Doreen when I, when I uh, first saw the journals, like how miraculous it is to look at that makeup and how incredible it is. And that's all completely unretouched. It is painterly as good as like a Michelangelo. I mean, it is that beautiful, that perfect, that, that it's executed with such precision. And, and, you know, that doesn't exist anymore. There's a lot of people kind of have a lot of leeway because there's digital retouching. And I remember when I first had to get my pictures taken to a, a place in New York where they would hand paint my photographs. And that's what was done then. And if, if that was done, and maybe it didn't have to be done if you had Kevin there. And so right. Yes, right. Photographers would hire Kevin because they knew that they wouldn't have to do those types of yeah, things. Yeah, when it, when it needed to be really precise and yep. really perfect. Yeah, he was, he was truly a, um, it was a reason why he's a legend. And what would you say is the through line for you with these journals for as many entries as you've seen at this point? What stands out the most to you about them? Um, you mentioned that there was, you know, this lovely combination of all of his important projects and jobs being documented also along with like family meetings and family appointments. But is there anything else about his journals that really, you know, when you when you saw all of them at that first time that you saw them and you you said you started crying. What what struck you? What was the first thing that struck you? I think there's something there that the that that I felt deeply that he knew that it needed to be documented. That he knew that people would look back and be looking at it. I don't know. I felt this deep knowledge of that. That he wanted these to be seen that he wanted there to be to have a legacy yeah that's and, really that's <sighs> just a some it's poignant to think about that yeah and the journals are still a work in progress as we yeah. said um they're still being produced or, still or being, digitized uh, digitized and, pr and uploaded for people to you know to see more and more of the images there's a lot there there's many years many many journals and so how many, how many would you say are available for viewing now and where can people find them if they wanted to go? I know that if you have the Makeup Museum app, there's yes. an app. Right you now, can... yeah, everything that has been digitized and has been uploaded is available on the, on the Makeup Museum app and it will continue to be more and more over time. Um, we wanted to just get what we had up because we wanted people to have access to what we had. But, though, you know, I know we could have waited till it was all done and then done. But we were just like, you know what, let's put it up and then we'll just keep adding. Um, and so we're just going to keep adding as it comes. And, you know, it wasn't a huge amount at first, but I think right now we have like a lot, lot more of it done than, than we did before. And I think there are some things we probably want to save for the exhibition um because i mean when you think about the fact that these are real these are real avidons these are real you know her, her, <laughs> you know these are actual photos um even though they're polaroids they're real they're from they're photos you know, of value they're yeah. photos of value from legendary photographers and legendary teams of artists that uh work together in that specific era at that very specific time that i'm so grateful he documented because it's a bygone era and That's um and, you know, these Mizell photos that, you know, that were just outtakes, but then uh, we know the finished photo, but we see these incredible outtakes of how they got there. And that, to me, the process behind it and getting to see a little bit window into that process makes these just invaluable. Yes, I, I agree. I always love that part of the job. And it's just incredible because these journals really, they not only document, as you said earlier, they not only document his top jobs. I mean, yeah, you know these really top top projects he was working on, but they also, you know, give a lot of insight into his creative mind and his creative life, and right? and and the relationships that he had formed, and the relationships that he had, which yeah. were so strong, which were so heartfelt, and and his love for what he did, 
overflowed over onto his clients and it overflowed back to him. And I love what Samantha said in, in, uh, in our interview, which was that he was very vulnerable with his, with people, like with the women in his chair, he felt safe to be vulnerable with them. He shared a lot about himself and in turn, they shared a lot about themselves and they gave their vulnerability back. And that is what Kevin's relationships that were so deep because of that, there was this shared, you know, obviously lots of laughter and, and hilarity, but then this really genuine vulnerability on both sides that they allowed him, they, they trusted him to create the things that he created with them, that they, that those images still stand the test of time is, is, a, is because of the trust that his clients had for him. To everyone viewing and listening to our live, there's a lot more on that very subject. Uh, our podcast with Rachel Goodwin, Doreen Block, and also Kevin O'Quinn's niece, Samantha Atkinson. It launches right after this live, so be sure to check it out. We're on Apple, we're on Spotify, everywhere where you can uh, listen to podcasts. And before we go, Rachel, do you want to just share the address for the museum and the hours for people? Yeah, so it's... Um... Oh my gosh, I want to, I hope I'm not messing up. It's 45 Gan Gansevoort. Um, it's right across- 94 the, Gansevoort 94, Street, 94, sorry. I in the, the meatpacking district in the here meat in packing New York. District, yes, um, and, it's, and it's open right now on weekends for, and you buy your tickets uh, because of COVID. Obviously we have a limited amount of, of uh, tickets that we, that we can have groups come in, but you know, this won't be forever, but for now it's just the way it is. And we want to be safe and use all the safety protocols and, so um, you can buy tickets online and then you come by appointment and you have a full tour. And it's incredibly, um, it's incredibly lovely. And, and it's so much fun as you've gone. It's just, it's a really wonderful analog escape from this time period in this world and kind of just going into the world of beauty from, you know, a, a bygone era. And, uh, you know, we wanted to give a little bit, obviously we wanted to educate, but we really want to inspire people to be more curious about it is what we really hope that you'll get from the exhibition. And, you know, you'll leave a little happier in, you know, in the world and your lipstick will be a little more fun to apply. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's pretty, it's a pretty yeah. space. There's yeah. lots of pretty fun things and it's a bit interactive. So yeah. definitely I mean, check it out. Yeah, Rachel, it was great to see you again. Thank you so much. And this is a really everyone, fun conversation. Of course, everyone. I love talking to you. I could talk to you for hours and days. Everyone, be sure to check out the podcast. It launches now.